Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Cannabis Business Live. My name is Jennifer Domain and I'm joined today by Principal Attorney of the Cannabis Legal Group, Barton Morris. We'll be talking today about the Impaired Driving Safety Commission report that was recently released by the state of Michigan. Mr. Morris was a contributor to that report, so we're honored to have him join us today to discuss the findings and the research on that report and uh, talk a little bit more about what it means and what we can kind of take away from that and what the state might do. Uh, but before that, let's talk about the news. For the news today, on the federal level, we do have the Safe Banking Act moving out of the committee. It is headed to the United States House of Representatives floor for discussion. The Safe Banking Act provides safe harbor and guidance for financial institutions that wish to provide uh, legal banking services for legal cannabis businesses. It also prevents banking regulators from punishing financial institutions that wish to work with these cannabis businesses. I passed out of the House Financial Services Committee with a vote of 45 to 15 in favor of cannabis businesses. And what was notable is that out of those 45 votes, 11 of those votes were from Republicans. So this shows that this has very strong bipartisan support. In fact, there is, I believe, 152 co-sponsors on this bill, which is nearly a third of the House. And it has more than any cannabis reform legislation in history. We do believe that this will uh, pass on the House level and it'll move to the Senate. Next up, we have a temporary restraining order for temporary operators. This was uh, news as of yesterday. There was a temporary restraining order and order to show cause that was filed in a lawsuit against the department for enforcing the shutdown of temporary operators on March 31st. If you might remember, the Medical Marijuana Licensing Board had adopted a resolution that would require the shutdown of all temporary operators on March 31st of this year. The temporary, uh, uh, the, the temporary restraining order, excuse me, prohibits the department from enforcing the shutdown of those temporary operators until a court hearing before the Michigan Court of Claims on April 9th of this year. If the suit against the department is to be successful, then the temporary operators will be able to temporarily operate until they have full licensure or an appeal hearing, or until the state imposes a new shutdown date or if the Court of Claims imposes a new shutdown date. Next up, we have Mr. Andrew Brisbo being named director of the Marijuana Regulatory Agency by Governor Gretchen Whitmer. He had been the director of the Bureau of Marijuana Regulation since 2017, and he will lead the Marijuana Regulatory Agency and its regulatory oversight over all Michigan medical and adult use marijuana uh, industries in the future. Lara has also received a release to bulletins today regarding CBD and industrial hemp. This was joint guidance provided by the Bureau of Marijuana Regulation and the Michigan Department of Rural Agriculture and Rural Development. In regards to industrial hemp, the guidance does state that if CBD is added to food, drink, or dietary supplements, it must be approved by the FDA for its intended use. However, the FDA has not yet approved any CBD products, so to add that to any food, drink, or market it as a dietary supplement is technically illegal at this point. However, there are hemp items that are generally regarded as safe. Those include hemp seeds, hemp seed protein, and hemp seed oil, which would not require FDA approval. Growing industrial hemp, they said, would require a license from MDARD, uh, and the applications are being drafted right now. CBD produced from marijuana would not be regulated as marijuana if the THC content is below 0.3%. However, if it is over 0.3%, then it would continue to be regulated by the Bureau of Marijuana Regulation. There are administrative rules being drafted currently. However, there's no method for licensed marijuana facilities to obtain industrial hemp at this point in time. All CBD products that, were, that would be ingested and sold under the current framework would have to be obtained from licensed growers, licensed uh, growers growing legal uh, medical marijuana and uh, processed by licensed processors under the MMFLA. 
And that's it for the news today. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Actually, I would like to continue that discussion with regard to a couple of the things that you just talked about because I think that a couple of these things are fascinating. Uh, first of all, uh, with respect to the Bureau's bulletin regarding CBD, uh, mm -hmm. today I read that Walgreens is publicly announcing, did you, did you see this? They're publicly announcing that they're going to begin selling CBD products, right? Absolutely. Now this is something that I was particularly interested in because I've been telling people that have been coming to me like you shouldn't be doing that, right? And because uh, CBD products haven't been regulated by the FDA and therefore it's unlawful in order to be able to sell them. Yet yeah, Walgreens, which is a, a, a name of a company that we all know is vo vocally going out and doing it. Uh, what do you, I mean, how do you reconcile that? Well, first I think it's important to note that this guidance is related to the FDA and it's uh, related to food, drinks, and if it's generally ingested into the body uh, by a dietary supplement or other ingestible forms. Uh, Walgreens at this point in time might just be focusing on topicals or something that isn't ingested by the body. At that, using that framework, we might be able to get around the FDA approval process. The article did say that that they because I was looking for that right. Mm -hmm. Are they going to sell products that had uh, or that contained uh, CBD and food products? But mm -hmm. they didn't. It, it was specific about the fact that they were going to sell products that were topical in nature, mm -hmm. uh, not anything that's like intended to be ingested. Uh, in, into the body, at least orally. Uh, so that, that was mentioned. Also, but it was also mentioned that despite the FDA or their, their uh, fact that they haven't regulated it yet, they're gonna, they're gonna sell it anyway. So literally like the statement directly from Walgreens said, we know that it's a, there's a gray area, yet we're going to sell it anyway. Uh, is this not a, uh, a tacit, uh, uh, communication that other people can do the same thing, like other businesses should feel free uh, because Walgreens is doing it? Well, I think it's one of those situations where just because somebody is doing it doesn't mean that necessarily it's legal and that everybody should be doing it. However, I think that it is a huge step forward for the industry to have such a major player such as Walgreens to uh, start to sell these products. And I think it sends a major message to the FDA and to the federal level saying, we're going to be selling these products. We should be regulating them appropriately. Let's get a move on. Let's create a framework that this will be legal for everybody to do this now. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but I also think that this is another illustration of when gray market uh, scenarios that we have in marijuana that come up all the time. There's different people doing different things. Other people, different people interpret it differently. And, and then you have lawyers like me, like expert lawyers saying you shouldn't be doing this yet. Other, other lawyers are saying that it's okay. And, and you get like different opinions across the board. It's it's, uh, it's, it's fascinating, I, I think it's fascinating. Uh, but this is exactly what we've been dealing with uh, in marijuana law uh, since we've begun, right? Like just different interpretations and, and different manners of uh, interpreting the circumstances. So uh, this is another example of that. Before we move on, I also wanna talk about the Safe Banking Act too, because that is, uh, I think, it's historic, right? I mean, like, this is the first. Obviously, it's the first time that uh, any pro marijuana marijuana related uh, bill is going to move through uh, Congress and onto the into the House floor. Uh, but you know, think about that. Like, there's going to be likely a favorable uh, vote on this, and it's likely going to pass the House and potentially the Senate. This is going to be the first piece of like legislation that. Uh, that gets through Congress that's pro, pro marijuana. Uh, I, I think that that is unbelievable. And it's about banking. So what, the fact that it's about banking, what does that tell you? The fact that it's about banking tells me that the legislators are responding to the current needs of the industry first and foremost. They aren't trying to push forward with a uh, full federal uh, deschedulization of cannabis at this point in time, they're starting off with smaller chunks. I think that by fixing a very major issue we have in the current industry and garnering support on both sides of the aisle is crucial for that next step of having it fully deschedulized. I agree. Uh, and <clears throat> if you were to ask a majority of people, uh, the biggest problem that the industry has 
uh, right now, especially federally, is banking. The lack of traditional financial services that uh, marijuana companies have not had the ability to enjoy. Just yesterday, last night, I was at a uh, I was at the Pistons game, and I had a client come to me and say, you know what? Now that there's been some movement uh, with respect to banking, I'm willing to to get into the industry now. Right? Mm -hmm. Like when he said that to me yesterday, it made me realize that that this is a huge deal like now there's a bunch of people that have otherwise not wanted to get into the industry now are willing to do it so mm -hmm. not only is this going to cause a lot more money to get into the industry because there's a lot more security regarding financial services and the fact that there'll be more financial services but these banks also have money right and they will be able to lend money to those uh, individuals that are interested in getting into the in the industry, uh, and then of course accepting all of the credit cards and, and, and all the just traditional financial services that we've all been accustomed to having. Yet, and the marijuana industry hasn't had it yet. And I think that's absolutely. I mean, this is. I think this is going to be. This is going to change the game. I think it also provides a, another level of normalization to cannabis overall we're getting away from the black market cash only transactions you know I can only take paper money I can't use my credit card I can't use you know any of your your apps because maybe that you know will be seized or what have you I think that by having banks say we support you we will work with you we will lend you money we will take your money and we're not going to punish you or be punished for working with you it just adds more legitimacy to the industry as a whole. Absolutely. Uh, and I want to acknowledge and thank the National Cannabis Industry Association because it's my belief, uh, actually I know for a fact, that this is an issue that they have been working on for many years, like eight or nine years. So this, just, just, this didn't just happen uh, because we have a, uh, a Congress, or at least a House, that's controlled by uh, Democrats. This has been something that they have been pushing for and working on for, for quite a while, and so uh, they definitely deserve, not, not just them, obviously, but they, the, the Cannabis Industry Association, the National NCIA, definitely deserves some credit uh, for, for pushing this uh, to happen so early on in 2019, and I'm quite certain that there's gonna be other big developments with respect to federal cannabis reform uh, later on this year as well. Okay. All right. Uh, and also, congratulations to and Andrew Brisbo. I don't want to, I don't want to dwell out too much, but I, I, I like that guy a lot. I have heard him. I've met with him many times. He's been on our show, uh, which of course legitimizes his. <laughs> him. But but more importantly, he, this is a guy that has demonstrated that he is going to work with the industry uh, in order to uh, in order to, to to do a good job in order to effectuate. Uh, the, its purpose in order to uh, do exactly what, the opposite what our medical marijuana licensing board has done thus far, which is continue to fight us. Instead, he's going to work with us. And, and I think that that change uh, in him uh, directing the Bureau of Marijuana Regulation is going, to be, uh, is going to be great. So congratulations to him as well. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about the Impaired Driving Commission, right? Is that, is that what it's called? Impaired Driving Safety Commission. The Close. Impaired Driving Safety Commission was created by a, a statute, by a statute, by a law uh, that was introduced in 2017, right? And in 2017, our Michigan legislature said, you know what, I think that they thought that there should be a number associated uh, with somebody's, uh, the amount of marijuana in their body in order to correlate with intoxication, much like alcohol. Everybody is familiar with the fact that uh, you have 0.08 grams of 210 liters of breath or 100 milliliters of blood in their body, that means they're guilty of drunk driving, operating while intoxicated. Well, the law right now is that any amount of marijuana in your body, in your driving, uh, is you're guilty of marijuana, excuse me, driving while uh, intoxicated, drunk driving. So the legislature recognized that that's simply just not fair. The fact is, is that at that time we have medical marijuana. Now we have uh, recreational adult use marijuana. The any amount standard basically puts people in jail and convictions on their record but that simply just don't deserve it. So uh, they, they enacted this law to create a commission. The commission's duty was to uh, study uh, the, the, and make a determination as to uh, whether a specific amount of THC in our bodies um, equates to driving under the influence of marijuana. Now, are you familiar with some other states that have done this? 
I am. I know that there are six states that have uh, imposed threshold amounts for per se impaired driving, uh, uh, per se impaired driving. Yeah. Uh, and so we have three states that have imposed a nanogram level of five nanograms per milliliter. Uh, that's Washington, Colorado, and Montana. Ohio and Nevada have reduced that to two, and Pennsylvania has reduced that even further to one nanogram. So we have kind of a wide range between these different states. But the one that I find most interesting is Colorado. Uh, rather than saying five nanograms per milliliter, you're absolutely under the influence. Colorado said that this is a reasonable inference, meaning that a jury can reasonably infer that at five nanograms, you are under the influence, you are impaired. However, a defendant can present evidence to rebut that presumption, and they can show evidence to show that they were not under the influence, that they were a safe driver, that there was no issue in the condition of their driving ability uh, with that five nanograms or more in their system. So that's something that Colorado has done that is different than other states, but that's not what Michigan has found, correct? Right, so Michigan, uh, like I said, our legislature has, uh, they saw fit to create a commission about this, right? And I am on the, uh, the council for the marijuana law section of the State Bar of Michigan. And uh, it's made up of about 800 lawyers. I'm on the board of that organization. And it was uh, determined that we should have a position on that particular issue. And I was designated as the chair of the science committee uh, to, to, write a com uh, to write a position on it. My position was is that in order to create this commission, in order to have it fairly administered, there should be a defense lawyer and a prosecutor included on this commission because at the time that wasn't called for. Uh, I wrote a very detailed like eight page paper on it talking about uh, these particular issues about the fact that it's very difficult to come up with a scientifically supported nanogram amount that would equate to intoxication of marijuana. Uh, and, I support, and, I, and I sent that into the Michigan legislature to the governor and they ignored it. They, they, seemingly they ignored it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I never got a response from it. It's something that uh, I had a big resentment about. And so I took that resentment and I went directly to uh, the individual who, uh, who, support, uh, who um, introduced this bill, uh, and Lucido, uh, Representative Lucido, Pete Lucido from uh, Macomb County. And, and, I, and, I, and I confronted him. I remember it was at a, was at a meeting, it was a seminar, I think, of the marijuana law section uh, for the State Bar of Michigan. And I said, look, you know, uh, why don't you have a defense attorney on this commission? It only makes sense because we're talking about a criminal offense, right, or a criminal law, where uh, if, if you're going to have like a, an impartial uh, commission that is fully informed, you should have a defense lawyer on it. Uh, and he uh, said, oh yeah, you're absolutely right. Perhaps you will be selected to do a presentation. And I challenged him and I said uh, to the commission, and I challenged him, I said, yes, I should. Because if, if, it, wasn't for, if it wasn't me, then pretty much I think that I'm the, the most qualified individual to do so, or one of them anyway. So, uh, and thankfully they did, they reached out to me. In fact, that's why I have this mug right here. And that's why I am uh, bringing it, did I even, did I tell you about this? This was the mug that they gave me when I did the presentation. Okay. In fact, I have, uh, you're gonna probably see a, a picture of when it was presented to me. That is the uh, colonel uh, uh, and uh, another, uh, another Michigan State Police officer who gave me this, or presented me with this mug uh, as a gift, which I'll be honest with you, I was, I am flattered and, and happy that they invited me. I was actually wasn't expecting a mug. Uh, and, and, and I love this mug. It's actually really, really deep too. So like, there's a lot, of, a lot of coffee. So uh, they did, I did present to uh, this commission. It was in, uh, I think April or May of 2018. They met throughout 2018 and 2019. And let me tell you something, I was very impressed with the work that they did. Not only did I present uh, to them, I gave them an hour long presentation. The very next meeting, which was in July of 2018, they heard from the, for, the foremost expert on marijuana and psychomotor impairment. Her name is Marilyn Hustis. She has written I, probably a hundred different papers uh, and done countless numbers of studies 
related to marijuana and many different issues, but very much including uh, driving under the influence of marijuana and psychomotor impairment and what marijuana does to people's bodies when they use it. And this is a very, it's a very complex subject. So Marilyn came in, Dr. Hustis came in and also gave a presentation. Certainly, uh, she's a lot more qualified than me, I, I, I totally admit, but uh, it, it goes to the, it, it shows the lengths at which that this commission went in and did the work necessary in order to uh, come up with their findings. And, and I found that they, they, they came up with some very accurate and well thought out findings. All right, so last, oh no, earlier this month, they came out with uh, their findings uh, in a report. It's available online, it's available at our website. And in summary, the report says this, that, oh, but let, me, let me actually point out another thing. This is very interesting, at least I find it interesting. The statutory language that created this commission gave it a, a specific uh, mandate, which was to find a scientifically supported number that equates to intoxication or impairment of marijuana. It didn't say, what are your opinions about it? It said, find the number. It right. directed them to find a number, mm -hmm. right? That was one of the problems that I had with this law. It says, what if there isn't a number, right? right? And this is one of the things that I stressed to them when, uh, when I did the presentation to them, is that you, you don't have to find a number, or perhaps you shouldn't find a number, because perhaps a number doesn't exist. And that's exactly what I had argued to them, and guess what, that's exactly what they found. Their study, their, their findings in that report found that a scientifically supported amount of THC, in somebody, active THC in somebody's body, does not equate reliably across the board to impairment or intoxication of, uh, of uh, marijuana uh, or driving. So this is, uh, this is great. It's great for a lot of different reasons. Of course it's great because they agreed with me. But I, trust me, I'm not trying to say that they, the only reason I said it, I mean that they agreed with me just because I said it. Uh, because it's true. And we're gonna talk about that, um, the reasons why here. Any comments? The other thing that I thought was really interesting about this report is they said not only do we not recommend a number, but we specifically recommend that there be specific roadside sobriety tests that are implemented. So we don't see the need for stating a number right now, but we do think that it is important to have sobriety testing, and they gave further guidance on that that we'll get into, but that's something that I find to be really, really uh, indicative of their opinion and their, uh, just of their overall impression going forward through this report, something to keep in mind. Uh, you were asking me a question early, and I don't remember what it was. <laughs> now, your opinion about uh, about the work that they've done, about the thoroughness of that report. You read the report, oh, right? Oh, yes. And uh, the fact that they bring in experts on criminal law, substance abuse treatment, uh, they brought in people for forensic toxicology and pharmacology, safety research regarding traffic safety. They brought in experts from all sorts of different areas that were able to uh, have an opinion, explain their position, and create a really well thought out analysis before they just wrote their report. And to me, that shows that the state is considering all of the issues and looking really critically uh, when they're evaluating whether or not to have a number and what that number should be. Uh, so to me, the fact that they took such a detailed analysis really speaks volumes. Let me uh, go over briefly in summary the reasons why uh, this uh, commission did not state that five nanograms or 10 nanograms will automatically make somebody intoxicated because the fact of the matter is not true. One of the biggest reasons why it's not true, as many people that use cannabis know, is that tolerance is a very big issue and it's bigger than in, in, with alcohol. So a lot of people know that, of course, a 0 .08 uh, amount of alcohol in their body could make somebody intoxicated, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that generally is true. Tolerance is definitely an issue there as well. People that drink more often will be less intoxicated. But in general, at that number, they found it to be scientifically supported that most people will be uh, intoxicated and that they will, gener they will, anything above that, they're gonna be an unsafe driver. Uh, in marijuana, that's not true. In marijuana, uh, and some other drugs, by the way, tolerance is a significant factor because chronic users will build up a tolerance to the degree to which that, that many of them won't have any effect in their driving 
at all. And, and this is true. I'm not suggesting that driving under the influence of marijuana at any time is safe, and nor would I uh, ever support that. I don't. Uh, but the fact is, is that people that use marijuana more often are much, much more tolerant to its effects, uh, especially if they're using the same types of strains or the same types of marijuana and they're ingesting it uh, in the same fashion, meaning they're, they're smoking it as opposed to, to using it in other fashions, which I'll talk about in a second as well. Tolerance is, 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 a, uh, is a big deal. Uh, you agree? <laughs> I would agree. I also think that uh, they took some time to explain the differences between how it's administered and how quickly your body can process it in uh, addressing tolerance, but also when your peak THC levels hit. And I think that kind of played a role in whether or not uh, they found that there should be some sort of nanogram level. For instance, uh, the inhalation route for administration, uh, I think they said that there was effects after three to 10 minutes and that is so much shorter than taking it um, through like an edible, which they said was an average of 120 minutes. So to have such a wide range in the uh, length of time before you have peak THC uh, content in your bloodstream is really, I think, a uh, an interesting point that they took into consideration. This is probably the biggest difference. No, this is the biggest difference between an ingestion of marijuana and the ingestion of alcohol. There's many different ways to introduce marijuana into the body. There, of course, is smoking. Then, of course, there's vaping. But then, of course, there's eating. Right. So we're nobody's smoking alcohol when they're when they're drinking. Right. Mm -hmm. They're 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 drinking. It. That's it. Nobody. Else, I, I don't think there's any other way. At least I'm not any any common way that people are introducing alcohol into their body. Right. They're drinking it in one form or other, whether it be a shot or a beer or wine. It's all going through the body the same way. But marijuana, it's not. Vaping and smoking is different, but certainly, and there's going to be different different uh, absorption and elimination effects. Meaning that vaping uh, will have different absorption effects. Uh, the peak amount of THC in somebody's body when they're vaping is going to be different uh, than smoking, but, but much more similar as, co as opposed to or compared to eating it. When you're eating cannabis, eating marijuana, of course, brownies, uh, gummies, candies, whatever that may be, cookies, uh, that is going to take a much longer time to reach a peak uh, concentration of THC. And somebody at five nanograms uh, or even 10 nanograms of marijuana in their body after they've eaten it is going to be completely feel completely different than somebody who smoked it and then had five or 10 nanograms of marijuana in their body. We're talking about completely different effects with completely different routes of administration. Uh, and not only that, we're talking about the fact that, that when you're eating it, it can take hours for it to be affected or affect you to have that peak uh, like psychomotor impairment, but then there's gonna be this elimination that's gonna take a long time as well. And you should, and everybody should realize is that during that elimination process, so let's say you get a peak of let's say 80 uh, nanograms and it comes back down. Uh, when it's coming back down, the effects of that marijuana, the psychomotor impairment and the ability to impair somebody's driving is going to be eliminated much quicker than the concentration of THC within their, within their bodies and in their blood. So somebody could be easily at 10, 15 nanograms of THC in their bodies hours after they had taken uh, orally the drug, mm -hmm. yet have absolutely no psychomotor impairment at all, meaning their, their ability to drive is completely fine. And so there's just so many different ways and so there's, there's no way to consistently uh, uh, determine whether somebody is driving under the influence of marijuana when you're only taking into consideration the concentration of THC within their body. That's fascinating, isn't it? It is fascinating. What I think is more fascinating is this. I've been, I've been uh, interviewed by this uh, about this over the past couple of days because I am mentioned in the, in the report as a uh, contributor, as a knowledge. And the questions that I were getting were, were basically like this. Uh, well, uh, then how can, well, how can somebody then, how can police then make a determination as to whether somebody is intoxicated by marijuana if we can't uh, only look at the amount of THC within their body? And the answer is, is many different things. First of all, their observations. Police are, are trained to observe 
whether somebody is intoxicated. They can do that first through an observation of their driving. If somebody is driving in a manner especially that's consistent with being intoxicated by marijuana, the police, well-trained police, could in fact uh, identify somebody, use it to begin with. Now, I know that in our notes I wrote something called A-RIDE, uh, A-R-I-D-E, do you know what that is? Uh, I looked it up and oh. it was uh, advances is in roadside impaired driving enforcement. Yes, yeah. advanced in, impaired driving enforcement. All right, so All right. Be, nice job. Thank you. Let me tell you what that is. All that right. is a very specialized um, training mm -hmm. that is given to police officers all over the country, mm -hmm. right? It is the next level of training after SFST, standardized field sobriety testing. Okay. That is regarding alcohol. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think every single police officer that's on the road takes that SFST training. Mm -hmm. The next level of training is A-RIDE. And A-RIDE uh, is specific to drugs. In particular, now not just marijuana, but specifically like drugs and controlled substances uh, and other like prescription medications, non-prescription medications. So uh, if a police officer is A-RIDE trained, they will learn uh, how marijuana specifically, uh, if somebody that's impaired by marijuana specifically affects their ability to drive. And they, they learn specific field sobriety tests that can be administered in order to continue to investigate somebody that's suspected to be driving under the influence of marijuana. We don't, what I'm saying is we don't need a specific nanogram level only to determine whether somebody's intoxicated, which is not going to work anyway. It's only going to be unfairly enforced. Uh, but police officers can be trained to uh, to do more work to help il illustrate and understand whether somebody is driving under the influence of marijuana. And it isn't just that they sh can be trained, they should be trained. Yeah. If they're not gonna have a nanogram threshold amount, then they absolutely should be trained. And that's something that this report also says is important. We have a, a suggestion that there is mandated A-RIDE training for all of our police officers in the state now because there will be no nanogram, or there, there's recommended uh, a no nanogram threshold amount. So for uh, the 16 hour training, I think it'll be well worth it for all of the police officers to engage in this training and be able to use that specialized knowledge to find uh, instances of impaired driving with cannabis users. Absolutely. Uh, the, and the report actually is, uh, the commission I should say, did a wonderful job in pointing that out as well because they didn't have to do that. That wasn't part of their mandate, but they did so because uh, that was necessary uh, in order to really put everything in context. Uh, mm -hmm. So they, they, they did a wonderful job. I'm very, very happy with, with what they did and what they reported. Uh, and Michigan should be happy. We should be proud yes. that we did the work uh, necessary to really put the truth out with respect to uh, this particular issue. All right, let's move on to what happens next, right? Because, uh, and this really also touches on our new law. The, the report and the commission did take into consideration our new law, the Michigan Regulation and Taxation of Marijuana Act, and I'll discuss that really quick because that has an effect on, on this uh, commission's report for this reason. Uh, there was a case called People versus Kuhn that was argued in the Michigan Supreme Court, and this was with respect to somebody that was had a medical marijuana card. So uh, this was before our new uh, adult use uh, legalization. This was with respect to a uh, medical marijuana user, but the same analogy applies. It applies because uh, that court identified the fact that it is, it is fine to be internally in possession of marijuana. Therefore, somebody that has a medical marijuana card, they may, they may have marijuana in their pocket, medical marijuana in their pocket, but they also are permitted to have marijuana in their bodies that they've already smoked and that's in their blood. And because the court found that to be true, it said that they are not uh, going to be held to that standard of any amount. Meaning that like when, when somebody that has a medical marijuana card uh, the police have to pr prove actual impairment or actually actually intoxication, driving under the influence, meaning intoxication. Uh, they have to prove that. They can't just say any amount. So the fact of that matter means is that that same thing applies now that we have adult use. But they've legalized marijuana for adults, therefore that is, that is true for them as well. They are permitted to be an internal possession of that marijuana and therefore that uh, all adults are now are going to be subject to uh, they're not subject to that any amount law there's their sub it's going to be the police have to prove intoxication um, thankfully so the question then becomes well then what really needs to happen right like if everybody gets to drive uh, without having to worry about that uh, any amount law does anything need to change uh, and the answer is 
Yes, it still needs to change. Right. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> um, for this reason. First of all, again, our law right now states that it's a, you get a drunk driving conviction for any amount in your body, unless, of course, you're an adult or a medical marijuana patient. What, what about those that aren't adults or out, aren't at medical marijuana patients? Let's say those that are 20 years old or 19 years old or 18 years old. Uh, it applies to them, and there's no reason why we should exclude them when everybody else gets to drive and not have to worry about the any amount law, but those that are 20 years old, unfortunately, because they're not 21, Again, not suggesting that they should be using marijuana, but that's the fact of the matter is, is that that is going to be, there's going to be 20 year olds that are using marijuana. Uh, and, 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 and really, at, at almost any time during uh, the next several days after they use it, legally they shouldn't be driving. So the law has to change in that regard. The law is not, cannot be enforced fairly. Uh, and, and, and so our legislature now having uh, this report, it's incumbent upon them to make a change. Right, absolutely. I think they're going to have to take out any uh, amounts that are listed in the law, if it's any amount at all, if there's anything related to consumption of marijuana that uh, will impact individuals when they're driving, the legislature really needs to consider taking those out. Uh, also, I think that we need to have further clarification on what under the influence means, right? All right, let me talk about that for sure. a second. And the influence has been uh, uh, well defined uh, within our court, uh, excuse me, jury instructions, mm -hmm. right? So, and this is actually very important. Uh, under the influence means that a person's ability to drive a motor vehicle has been substantially and materially affected by the marijuana that they ingested to the degree to which that they are no longer able to operate that motor vehicle in a normal fashion. So that's a lot of stuff, right? But this is actually very meaningful. So first of all, materially and substantially affected by the marijuana, okay? So you can, you can smoke, some people, like I said, they're tolerant, right? Mm -hmm. So they can smoke marijuana and be able to continue to drive without their ability to drive to be materially and substantially affected. Mm -hmm. So that's very important to understand. Uh, the police actually have to get evidence of the fact that, and it's not just a little bit affected, materially and substantially affected, to the degree to which that they were unable to drive in a normal fashion. That is uh, something that's important as well. So not only do they have to find that somebody's ability to drive was materially and substantially affected, mm -hmm. the police or prosecutors also have to prove that their ability to drive in a normal, they were no longer able to drive in a normal fashion. So those are two separate things because somebody can be, let's say somebody, uh, somebody is, uh, use uh, has under the influence of marijuana to the degree to which that they're unable to walk a straight line, for instance. Okay. Yeah, they're able to drive, no problem. Okay, this, and this can, this can sure. and, and will happen. Uh -huh. uh, and, uh, this is it's another fascinating point about the fact that there's so many different strains of marijuana, there's so many different types, there's so many different routes of administration, there literally can be hundreds of different manners that somebody can be uh, affected, their psychomotor performance or their just ability to be, to drive or not can be mm -hmm. affected. So they have to demonstrate that their driving was bad too. Okay. That, so that, this is fascinating. Not a lot of people know that, I know that because my You're expertise. An expert. yeah. <laughs> but it's true. Uh, which means that the police officer's observations of an individual that they suspect to be under the influence of marijuana while they're driving is very important. Now, that doesn't mean that somebody can't be convicted of it if they got into an accident, the police never saw that driving. Um, uh, there's still evidence to demonstrate that somebody can be intoxicated uh, by marijuana and their driving had been convicted, I mean, had been um, uh, affected perhaps because they got in an accident. Uh, but that is, that is a necessity and that is a requirement. So uh, for those that uh, people that are, that are practitioners, defense practitioners, it's very important to remember that as well because that is something that uh, is easily forgotten. A lot of people don't, don't remember that, uh, that particular part. So um, what else? Oh, I know. All right, let's, let's end okay. on this. Okay. <laughs> um, a lot of people uh, think now that this report has come out, a lot of people think that because we've now legalized marijuana that there are going to be a significant increase of people using marijuana and then driving on the roads, that there's going to be a significant increase in, uh, in our uh, in traffic safety or the danger of uh, people driving on the influence of marijuana. There's going to be more people driving on the influence of marijuana. Um, what do you think about that? 
I think that while there's the possibility of more people legally consuming marijuana, the odds of us having significantly more crashes or traffic issues due to cannabis related um, consumption and then driving isn't really going to happen, mainly because I think alcohol is far more dangerous when it comes to driving than cannabis. We've had numerous studies showing that alcohol is uh, a substance that's going to create more risky behavior, faster driving, more erratic driving, uh, versus cannabis, which has been shown to lead to uh, greater distances and follow distances behind another vehicle, uh, slower driving, where cannabis users almost appear to be giving themselves extra space or uh, a little bit of grace, um, knowing that they're under the influence. So I really don't think that we're gonna have that many more crashes due to cannabis only. I mean, maybe if it's mixed with alcohol, that could have an impact, but I don't think that just by having the legalization and this report, we're suddenly gonna have an explosion of accidents related to cannabis. You are right. And so first, let me comment on the fact that, that many uh, opponents to legalization, they heard this a lot uh, before uh, we voted on it, and they mm -hmm. said that, look at other states, they're having, they're having more accidents. But the fact is, that has not been uh, demonstrated that it's because of uh, more drivers being under the influence of marijuana, mm -hmm. uh, first of all. I, I think that, looking at other states that have had longer periods of time like colorado and washington and oregon the the studies haven't been done yet mm -hmm. uh, so we don't know uh, conclusively from those other states mm -hmm. but we do have many studies as you had just pointed out that demonstrate that people under the influence of marijuana are not so much more unsafe as they are with alcohol in fact i think that i think a lot of people would probably agree that somebody under the influence of alcohol is much more dangerous as far as their driving as somebody that influence, under the influence of marijuana. Let me point to a couple studies that I happen to have right here. All right. All right. Uh, you may you may have met, you may have remembered that I talked about Marilyn Hustis, who mm -hmm. is who is by far the foremost expert when it comes to marijuana and the scientific studies with respect to marijuana. She is and did testify to the Impaired Driving Commission. Um, right after I did. Okay. And this is one of her uh, one of her uh, articles in uh, the Journal of Clinical Chemistry, 2013, March 2013. She wrote an article uh, along with uh, Dr. Hartman on cannabis effects on driving skills, where they found that although cognitive, I'm reading from actually something, uh, the actual article. Uh, although cognitive studies suggest cannabis may lead to unsafe driving, experimental studies suggest the actual opposite effect. Uh, and that really is to, because of the fact that this article illustrates, and I have another one that illustrates the same thing. Those that are, are under the influence of marijuana tend to be, or to drive with more care and caution. Now, I'm not saying that, that that means that they're driving safer, but they tend to be a little bit more paranoid and they tend to have, they, they recognize that they're, they have uh, an intoxication and they tend to actually dr try to drive safer to compensate for that. Compensation, right. Right. Whereas in alcohol, when you're driving under the influence of alcohol, you think that you're impenetrable. You can drive as fast as you want and you can be as safe as you want, or you, can, you, can, you will be safe because you, you, you feel the exact opposite, mm -hmm. right? So this is a scientific truth and probably anybody who has experimented with those with driving under the influence of marijuana probably agree mm -hmm. uh, that those driving under the influence of alcohol are much more dangerous. They tend to speed more, mm -hmm. uh, they tend to weave lanes more, whereas those driving under the influence of marijuana has been scientifically demonstrated to actually, they, t they try to be safer. Now, mm -hmm. their reaction times are, are less, or they're, they're, they're delayed, uh, they, that can lead to unsafe driving, will it lead to unsafe driving, mm -hmm. but um, comparatively so, much, much, much less dangerous uh, than alcohol. Here's another uh, study called the, let's see, this was in the American Journal of Addiction, um, dated, oh, May of 2010, the effect of cannabis compared with alcohol on driving. And in summary, uh, you can pull these up on like uh, Google Scholar. Most marijuana impaired drivers exhibit only modest impairment. Uh, uh, on those uh, on those physiological uh, studies, uh, the effects of cannabis vary more between individuals than they do with alcohol because of tolerance, the difference of smoking techniques, and the, dips in, the different absorption of uh, tetrahydrocannabinol 
which is the active ingredient in marijuana. Again, precisely what we had talked about earlier, what we had talked, what the commission found, that tolerance uh, and also the route of administration, uh, along with the fact that cannabis is just, is, it's, it's a different drug. The manner in which that it's uh, brought into the, to the uh, bloodstream, uh, it just has a, a significant different effect. It is not similar to alcohol. We cannot have a scientifically supported amount of nanograms in our blood that would correlate to uh, impairment. So I guess we can leave it at that. Um, anything further? Not today, but if you have any questions, please do feel free to leave a comment on our Facebook page or on our YouTube page. Reach out to us at any time. We'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Until next time. Yeah, thank you very much.